Jay Yang and Clarence Liu are joining us today to talk about Tassin, a decentralized crypto exchange that has raised $1.3 million to build out its product. Welcome, Jay and Clarence. Hi. Tell us, what is your product and who is it for? So Tassin is a no KYC non-custodial exchange. We're launching it in the US. Um, it's a, it solves a a uh, lot of problems that are in centralized exchanges, solves a lot of problems in decentralized exchanges. And what we're trying to do is build an exchange where privacy is preserved. We own uh, no data that uh, is of the traders. And then we uh, focus on the core exchange uh, experience by not being distracted by things like, oh, how do we safeguard custody and all of that stuff. Those things are done through code. And we ensure that they are uh, reviewed, uh, audited, and there, there is a formal verification that we'll, we'll do. And by ensuring that the technology is solid and that ensures the self-custody of the fund, um, we can then really focus on amping up the speed on the exchange part. There are other decentralized exchanges out there, like Uniswap, for example. How is Tassin different from what currently exists? I'd say Uniswap solves a lot of problems for many DeFi projects and many of the um, uh, projects on uh, Ethereum. It provides a really good model, but I think there are um, some duct tapes there that can be uh, replaced. Like uh, duct tape, what I mean by that is uh, automated market makers, and they needed to have that because they couldn't get sufficient liquidity to make the um, decentralized exchange process work. Um, the way that Tassin is different is that because we provide a ample tool that is similar to what centralized exchanges offer, that providing liquidity does not require you to dump a lot of money into these AMMs. Um, you can just change the order at the fastest speed possible to have a dynamic hedging. So I think that's, that's the main difference between uh, Uniswap and Tassin. Tell me about the fundraising experience. You have raised $1.3 million so far. How much more capital do you need to get this off the ground? So uh, our seed raise is targeting $2.5 million um, that we feel is the minimal needed to um, accelerate our growth. However, we actually have a planned private sale for another nine to $10 million. And the reason why we need that is because our smart wallet is connecting to multiple chains. Uh, currently we're on you know, Ethereum, RSK, uh, and Tron, a few others. But in order to really horizontally scale that out, we need to be able to connect to more, far more chains, such as Algorand, Hedera, Moonbeam on Polkadot, you name it. So all those integrations take a lot of money. And also being a legally compliant exchange in the US, we have far more legal hurdles to keep up with and um, things that we're doing like joining the blockchain association and being part of the ongoing scene, the regulatory scene are all pretty expensive. I know, you know, uh, CZ from Binance needed $10 million to start. He did very well. I think we'll need just the same as even probably more because we're actually trying to use the, the most leading technologies such as uh, Definity in, in, our, in our architecture. With any early stage company, hiring the wrong person can kill your startup. As an early stage DeFi company, who do you hire first, a lawyer or an engineer? So hiring by function, I, I'm not so worried about. I think it's um, my, my interview, <laughs> I am embarrassed to say my interviewing process is very straightforward. I talk to them for 30 minutes. I tell them what I'm building and, you know, it's either they're interested or they're not. Robinhood has been under scrutiny from regulators and users alike. Recent issues have ranged from platform outages to selling order information to high frequency traders to backlash for restricting trading of certain stocks like GameStop. As founders of a decentralized exchange, what do you think Robinhood could have done better? So one thing that as a centralized exchanges have, they have some limitations. If it is a technical problem, then they could have uh, anticipated this demand. They could have architected a little differently, more robustly, so that the, when, the, when there's a lot of people trying to summon order, then there are ways to handle this a little more gracefully. And fundamentally too, um, decentralized exchanges don't have that problem, right? We are, a lot of decentralized components are actually running on, say, the Divinity Internet Computer 
or on decentralized blockchains, those are pretty much always up. So if you architect around more decentralized components, then you offload that to a really resilient system because blockchains aren't just running one exchange, they're running the whole internet computer or the, a ton of different apps and they all have to run. In Robinhood's case, <clears throat> if you don't have access to the app, then you don't have access to your account. And that's a big problem, right? Um, you know, so you can't, you know, send more money in or take your money out. You can't even command it to do simple stuff like that, let alone trade. Uh, so in, in, in a decentralized exchanges case, you know, you, you certainly have control over your wallet and what you do with it. So you already have custody and you don't have to worry about what happens when quote unquote, whatever is hosting that website goes down, you can actually do what you need to do. And it's not to say Tassin is infallible, like any sort of centralized exchange could potentially go down. But in Tassin's case, we have a built-in two-day timer where if your smart wallet can't connect to exchange and for some unknown reason, there's a big fire explosion, who knows what could happen to a centralized exchange, you always have custody of your funds and in two days, you'll get all your funds back. So there's no risk of losing funds on Tassin um, and similar other exchanges as well. What is on the product roadmap for Tassin in 2021? We want to first audit all of our uh, open source code that we're going to release around uh, starting uh, third week of or uh, April, uh, first week of um, May time period. And around the same time, we'll integrate a large portion of our infrastructure code into the internet computer. Uh, it really hate, you know, speeds up our you know, pace of development. Uh, then around June, July time period, I want to say, we'll do a um, closed uh, beta. Then we'll move on to open beta um, in August, September time period. Then we will launch the exchange uh, soon after. And uh, that's going to be the crypto to crypto uh, exchange, no KYC, no custody. Then beyond uh, great things after that, 2022. Jay, Clarence, thank you for joining us. We'll be rooting for you as Tassin continues to grow. Thank you so much, guys.